When investigators are trying to find a missing airplane or solve an aviation mystery, the data that is the Ne Plus Ultra is the black box data. This is the, well, it really, there's two kinds of black boxes. There's the cockpit voice recorder, which records the uh, ambient sound in the cockpit. And there's the flight data recorder, which records thousands of parameters having to do with airspeed, location, the various positions of the controls, and so forth. This is the data that allows investigators to really nail down what happened in a crash. In the case of Air France 447, which we've talked about so often, it was the location of the wreck on the seabed and the subsequent uh, removal of the black box and the interpretation of the data that was in that black box that allowed investigators to really nail down what happened. Of course, that's what investi investigators were hoping to do with, with MH370. They, of course, so far have not been able to find the wreckage, have not been able to take the black box. We don't have that data. However, the black box data is not the only kind of physically retrieved evidence that can shine a light on what happened to the plane. We also have the debris. And the way that that debris came apart from the aircraft, the way that the aircraft broke, can tell us a lot about how the plane crashed and how it came to its final resting place. Today we're going to talk about what the wreckage of MA370 can tell us about what happened to the plane. Hi, welcome back to Finding MH370. I'm Jeff Wise, back with you. We're going to talk about breakage. There's five basic ways that a physical material can break. The, the two most important for our present purposes are tension and compression. A tension failure occurs when something is pulled apart. Think uh, when you pull on uh, two ends of a string and until it snaps. Compression is the opposite. It's what happens when something is crushed by a weight or smashed on impact. Think about an elephant standing on an eggshell. When a plane crashes, it's common for all different parts to exhibit different kinds of failure. Imagine a plane, uh, for instance, whose wingtip hits a tree. The impact would crush the leading edge of the wingtip. That's a compression failure. And then uh, the wrenching of the wing backwards uh, from the body of the plane would cause a tension failure at the forward wing root uh, and then a compression failure at the aft end. By collecting many pieces of debris after a crash occurs, investigators can tell a story. They can deduce how the sequence of events unfolded in a chronological order to tell a story that makes sense. This is how the mystery of TWA 800 was solved. This was an accident that took place in 1996, July 17th, 1996, a Boeing 747 uh, with 230 people aboard exploded 12 minutes after takeoff from JFK, rained pieces down into the ocean off the shore of Long Island. It sparked a four-year investigation. Ultimately, thousands of pieces of debris were recovered from the seabed. Altogether, about 96% of the, the airframe were, were taken, collected, brought to a hangar in Calverton, Long Island, and painstakingly reassembled. What they were able to deduce by looking at how these pieces had broken was that an electrical fault had caused a fuel tank to explode. And this caused a ballooning outwards of the skin of the aircraft fuselage. It came apart like a balloon popping. The plane broke into two major parts and you had one part that essentially blew outwards with a lot of tension failures. And then the front part fell and smashed into the ocean resulting in primarily compression failures, pieces being crushed together. So we have tension failures predominating in the first part of the accident and then compression failures later. And when the investigators pieced this together, they could really see a story unfolding as each type of failure occurred, causing failures that then caused a cascade of other failures of certain types and locations and everything fit together. Every 
everything told a holistic story that each piece in context made sense with all of the others. And this is something you see again and again in air crashes. All of the evidence tells you a different piece of a coherent story. That notably is something we, as, as people who've been listening to this podcast know, that's something we tend not to see in MH370. With MH370, each piece of evidence doesn't seem to make sense or doesn't seem to fit into all the other pieces. It, and that's why it's such a strange and baffling mystery. Let's, let's see if we can apply the, the, the lessons of TWA800 uh, to MA370. Can we apply the same technique of looking at the debris, the breakage patterns, the tension, compression, other kinds of mechanical failure, and see what kind of story that tells us when we look at the individual pieces of debris? Remember, there were several dozen pieces. Some of them definitely came from MH370. Others seemed that they came from from A777 and therefore were very likely to come from MA370. And others, we just don't know. They seem like they're part of an aircraft, but not necessarily this plane. Um, but in April of 2017, the Malaysian government released a report. Uh, it was titled Debris Examination Report that described 20 pieces of debris that had been collected in the preceding few years. And for 12 of them, investigators were able to discern the nature of the breakage the nature of the mechanical failure. What I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to go through some of these pieces and just briefly recap what the Malaysians reported about how these pieces had failed. And then we're going to try to see what sense we can make of that. Item number six was a right engine fan cowl. Uh, investigators reported, the fracture on the laminate appears to be more likely a tension failure. The honeycomb core was intact and there was no significant crush on the honeycomb core. Uh, so a, um, a tension failure, a pulling apart. Item seven, a wing to body fairing. Quote, the fibers appeared to have been pulled away and there were no visible kink on the fibers. The core was not crushed. It had fractured along the skin fracture line. Again, a pulling apart, a tension, a tension fracture. Item eight, flap support fairing tail cone. Quote, the fracture line on the part showed the fibers to be pulled out, showing tension failure. Most of the core was intact and there was no sign of excessive, of excessive crush. Item nine, upper fixed panel forward of the flap on left side. Quote, the fracture lines showed that the fibers were pulled, but there were no signs that they were kinked. The core was intact and had not crushed. Tension failure, pulling apart. Item 12, possible wing or horizontal stabilizer panel. Quote, the carbon fiber laminate had fractured and appeared to have pulled out, but there was no crush on the core. Tension failure. Item 15, upper fixed panel forward of the flap on right side. Quote, the outboard section had the fasteners torn out with some of the fastener holes still recognizable. The inboard section was observed to have signs of net tension failure as it had fractured along the fastener holes. Tension failure. Item 18. Right-hand nose gear forward door. Quote, close visual examination of the fracture lines showed the fibers were pulled and there was no sign of kink. Tension failure. Item 20. Right aft wing to body fairing. Quote, this part was fractured on all sides. Visual examination of the fracture lines indicated that the fibers appeared to have pulled away with no signs of kink on the fibers. Tension failure. Item 22, right vertical stabilizer panel. Quote, the outer skin had slightly buckled and dented, but the inner skin was fractured in several places. The internal laminate seems to be squashed. So here we have a compression failure. So this one's different. Item 23, aircraft interior. The fractured fibers on the item indicated the fibers were pulled out, which could indicate tension failure on its structure. Item 26, right aileron. The fitting on the debris appeared to have suffered a tension overload fracture, tension failure. Item 27, fixed forward number seven flap support fairing. One of the frames was completely detached from the skin. It may be due to fasteners pull through as the fasteners holes appeared to be torn off with diameters larger than the fasteners, a pulling apart, a tension failure. So it's worth noting in summation 
that except for one of these pieces, all of the pieces had failed under tension. They had pulled apart. Um, the exception being an item 22, which came from the tail, so the rear part of the aircraft. And this was uh, from near the leading edge of the vertical stabilizer. I find it particularly interesting that item number 18, which is the nose gear door, appeared to fail under tension. It was pulled apart. Because if you remember from the episode where we talked about how the plane impacted the water, assuming that it did impact the water, this would be a very high speed, almost the speed of sound impact nose first. So it's very striking that a plane that impacted nose first at incredibly high speed would somehow have that very, the chin of the aircraft essentially not smashed in, but pulled apart. Seems puzzling to me. In, in 2017, as I was beginning to report out this aspect of the case, I talked to Bill Waldock, who is a professor at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University who teaches air crash investigation. In fact, they have a facility where they have simulated air crashes, pieces of broken airplane where students can go and look at the different kinds of failure and try to ascertain what was the sequence of events in this, you know, make-believe air crash. And I put it to him, I asked him what kind of failure you would expect to see if the plane had engaged in a high-speed impact with water. Um, and he told me um, that you would expect to see a lot of compression, as was seen with the forward section of TWA 800. There were a lot of compression as the piece smashed into the water at high speed. As famously everyone knows, water at high speed is as good as concrete. Um, Bill Waldock told me um, that, yeah, particularly up toward the front part. You'd expect to find at least some compression in an impact. Particularly up toward the front part, uh, the frontal areas on the airplane, like the, the nose, front fuselage, leading into the wings. Right. That's where you'd find it the most. I also talked to another person who uh, was involved in the accident investigation for MH370. He talked to me on background, um, so I can't tell you who he worked for uh, or who he was, uh, so I'm going to change his voice. Um, but I asked him about his assessment of the pieces, given that he was inside the investigation. He had the kind of the inside dope. Um, and I asked him, first of all, about, I asked him, first of all, about the flapper on. This is a piece that there's been widespread speculation that if the plane's final dive had been extremely high speed, uh, as with Silk Air, which was a, a suicide where the pilot put the nose down and, and was going close to the speed of sound at impact, and pieces, the plane was going so quickly that pieces of the plane ripped off, people speculated something similar might have happened with MH370, perhaps the Flapron, which was the first piece to be recovered from Reunion Island, perhaps that had been ripped off as a result of aerodynamic forces uh, causing flutter, causing the piece basically to be ripped off. I said to him, does that look like, does, based on what you've seen of the flap run, does it look like it was ripped off by flutter? In a classic sense, no. Um, but, uh, you know, where, where you would be looking for flutter would be on the, on the stops, on the uh, mechanical stops that are up on the wings, because okay. that's part of that piece that came out. Um, and, you know, in looking at that piece, you know, it, uh, you've, got, you've got different types of failures of the composite skin mm. um, that, that don't necessarily, they don't appear to be flutter. What, is it, what does it look like? It, it looks, it just looks like uh, kind of an impact type separation. So it looks like you've, you've drugged that thing either in the water or on the ground or something. Oh, okay. But, you know, it, it's a little hard with that one because you don't have any other ones. So, you know, one of the keys, you know, you, you don't base anything on one small piece. You're trying to look at, you know, kind of a macroscopic view of okay. all the wreckage to make sure that, oh, if, if, if I think this is cluttered, then do I see the signatures elsewhere on the airplane? Mm -hmm. so, you know, typically we won't, we won't base it on that one piece like the bottom one. So what my source was trying to tell me is that in a professional air accident investigation, you don't tell a story based on a single piece. Remember, with TWA 800, they had thousands and thousands of pieces that had been painstakingly reassembled, like a jigsaw reassembled, 
put together on a on a jig so that the whole plane is sitting there in the hangar and and you can see how each piece relates to the other. One piece by itself might not tell you very much at all. And in the case of MH370, several dozen pieces sounds pretty impressive, but they're all from different parts of the plane, with a few exceptions. Um, and they don't really hang together. Whether that's because they just don't tell a coherent story, the, 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 the pieces themselves don't tell a coherent story, or there just aren't enough pieces to tell the story. Um, and this is what he said on this point. If you don't have any wreckage, you know, like in the case of MH370, we've got like seven or eight pieces from that airplane um, that doesn't tell the story. If you look at what, you know, if you look at the flapper on, it has a story, but how does it fit into the larger story? We just don't know. Yeah, I mean, Malaysia had released um, like a couple of weeks ago a report that had description of um, of, of the, I mean, very rudimentary description of, of how those pieces came apart. Um, I suppose you've, you've probably seen that. Yeah, I'm actually part of that case. Oh, you're part of that case. What, so what, um, yep. is there, is, so you, I mean, does it kind of fit in any kind of preliminary narrative? Um, you know, you can make a whole bunch of stories based off that one piece, mm -hmm. uh, but you know you can't really conclude anything because you have one little tiny piece of a very large airplane. But what if you take the the, the dozen or so pieces that they described? The other pieces uh, don't really help all that much because they're fairings. Uh, you know, they're they're pieces that don't really contribute to flight, you could lose them in flight and not have any problem. Uh, the flap are on the flight control, so it's kind of a, a critical piece of the airplane. All the rest is engine fairings, and, and there's a piece of horizontal stabilizer fairing, uh, you know, that, that don't really help tell any story. Yeah, I mean, one of the, I thought particularly interesting was the, um, the nose gear door. Um, which you would expect if it, so the Australians had thought that the plane nose kind of nose dived into the ocean, and yet this plane came apart apparently under tension, not under compression. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, we really, you know, and even the Australians really, we don't have any information to suggest how they, the airplane may have impacted the water. Right. Uh, you know, all we have is, is seven data points showing us where the airplane went. And you know, from there you can you can make a million assumptions on the on how it hit the water. You know, you could you could say, well, I could make a case for it landing on the water, or, you know, high speed impact, low speed impact, whatever. Right. I just don't know. When you get into an impact sequence too, you know, all the loads are changing. So you know, you're you're not you're not reacting the flight loads, the normal loads of the airplane you see, because as it starts to crumple and, and break apart, then pieces see loads that. They're not designed for it, so, uh, you know, even if it's the landing gear was tension well, okay, without anything else, that doesn't, that doesn't mean a whole lot. Without anything else, it doesn't mean a whole lot. So, just to put a pin on it, we have all of this debris. We can see how it came apart, but it doesn't add up to a coherent story. Now, there have been people who have come forward and said, ah, I have looked at photographs of pieces, especially the flapron, and I can tell you exactly what happened to this plane. I can solve the whole mystery for you. The, the take-home lesson, I think, from this episode is you cannot do that. All of the pieces together aren't even enough to tell a coherent story. And the one piece alone by itself, you cannot. We cannot tell from any of these pieces how the airplane hit the water, assuming that it did hit the water. Well, I hope this was interesting. Uh, this has been episode 11, season two of Finding MH370. Once again, if you appreciate what we're doing, please hit like, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff. Go over to our show page at findingmh370.com. You get a weekly newsletter and um, you can also make comments there. Ask me questions. I'm always here to help. That's all I have for you today. Once again, as I always say, don't stop looking and don't stop asking hard questions. See you next time.